Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Grover. With me is Ted Malaska. Those are our Twitter handles. We would love if you follow us on Twitter. Ted is a principal solutions architect at Cloudera, and I'm a software engineer. Guess what is the most common question we get in our presentations? Um, that is, where are the slides? And the answer to that question is the first link on the deck, and that's tiny.cloudera.com slash spark dash mistakes. I encourage you to follow along, but of course, you have all the slides visible on you as well. Another quick thing um, that we are co authors. Oh, Ted's taking selfie. Hey. Yeah. OK, we are co authors of this book called Hadoop Application Architectures that we wrote with two other great people. Um, the book talks about how do you architect applications in the Hadoop space. Spark is, of course, an important part of that architecture, but there are other things. How do you integrate with Kafka or Hadoop and so on and so forth? Um, and we have a book signing where you can get free books at 345 at O'Reilly booths if you want to come. All right, move on. So the reason we are here today is to talk about mistakes people make when they use Spark applications. But really, what we want to talk about is mistakes we've made, but we wanted to look smarter, so we talk about mistakes people made. <laughs> First mistake. This is you walk into your office, and you have this. You have six machines. You have 16 cores. You have 64 gigs of RAM. And I want you to just remember all these numbers, because these will come in handy as we move along in the slides. But when you start using Spark, Spark says, would you tell me how many executors you need? Would you tell me how many cores you need? And how much memory should I give to each executor? Right? So you're trying to bridge this gap between the physical world you live in as to how many nodes you have, how much memory and cores you have, to this world that Spark wants you to live in. There's a number of executors and cores for each executor and memory for each executor. By the way, I still haven't figured out if it's executor or executor, so I'm going to use them interchangeably in the presentation. Before we answer that question, let's do a quick architecture recap of Spark. So we'll start from the left side. You have a driver program which runs a Spark context. This driver program talks to the cluster manager, which sits in the right middle of the screen. The cluster manager could be Yarn or Mesos, could be standalone. This manages and acts as a liaison between the driver and getting resources for your worker nodes. You have one or more worker nodes. Each worker node can run one or more executors. Each executor can run tasks that get scheduled on the executor. And point to note is there's a cache that's shared within the executor between all tasks that run on the executor. OK, so keep that in mind, and we'll move on. So the first answer you may come up with is, why don't I make my executors the most granular possible? And what I mean by that is you will have the smallest size executors. In particular, you will give them one core each. Remember, your machines had 16 cores which means, and it has 64 gigs of RAM, so that means you would give 4 gigabytes of RAM to each executor, and you would give total of 16 times 6, 96 cores in your cluster, right? Turns out, that's the wrong answer. And why is that? Because you're not using the benefits of running multiple tasks in the same executor. Remember that cache, you're not really sharing and uh, sort of dealing with the benefits of that. So let's go to the other extreme. Why don't we have the most, uh, sorry, the least granular executors, which means we put the biggest executor we can on that node, and that would be just one executor. So we give it all the memory and all the cores in the cluster. Turns out that's the wrong answer either. And why is that? Because we need to leave some overhead for OS and Hadoop daemons to run. And so what we do is we leave out one, one core. That should be one core per node. Um, and then we also leave out one gig of RAM from the node, and we give the rest to each executor. So now we have 15 cores given to each executor, and we have 63 gigs of memory given to each executor, and each node has only one big executor. Turns out that's the wrong answer either. <laughs> so you ask, why are you fooling around with us? Why don't you give us the right answer? And before we get there, Let's assume for now on that we're going to talk about Spark on Yarn only. Uh, the discussion actually applies fairly well, but I think it keeps things more concrete. There are three things we need to talk about in order to get to the right answer. The first one is memory overhead. So when you request um, to Spark, here I want this much executor memory using that parameter, executor memory. Yarn adds an overhead before requesting that from the resource manager. And that overhead is the bottom line there. It's the maximum of 384 megs, or 7% of the, the, the parameter that you specified. So if your node had 64 gigs of RAM, RAM and you asked for 64 gigs, it's going to add 7% more to that and ask for 1.07 of 64 gigs from the resource manager. And resource manager is going to say, well, you're oversubscribing, and that's crazy. 
So what you have to do is when you pass that parameter, you have to reduce it by 7% or so, so Yarn, when it adds its overhead, is not um, asking for too much memory. The second thing you want to keep in mind is this concept of a Yarn application master. So Yarn clusters that use Spark on Yarn can run in two different modes. The first one is client mode, which is shown in this diagram. In the client mode, you have the client application, which runs a Spark driver on the left. In the middle, you have a Yarn container that runs a Spark application master. This diagram shows the cluster mode, in which you have uh, the Yarn application master running in the container, um, and then the driver runs within that. Point to note is that there is a Yarn application master running in both these scenarios. This is the client, this is the cluster, and it runs within a Yarn container. And that core that's used by the Yarn application master cannot be used for your regular Spark process, right? So you have one less core as a whole in your cluster to use than you had before. All right, and the third thing you want to keep in mind is HDFS throughput. So if you had bulky executors and you were giving all the 15 cores to just one executor, you're going to have really bad HDFS throughput. Uh, we've found canonically that it's best to keep the cores somewhere between four to six um, per executor, so five cores is what we came up with this. Okay, based on all that, let's do some calculations. So we'll start from bottoms up this time. We'll say only five cores at max per executor for maximum HDFS throughput, which because we left out one core for overhead, that leaves us with 15 cores on each of the nodes. We gave five cores to each executor, which means we'll have three executors on each of the nodes. In total, we will have um, 18 executors spread across all six nodes of the cluster. Remember, we're going to leave one executor for the Yarn application master, so we are left with 17 cores, 17 executors, sorry, that we're going to use in that cluster. And then. You divide 63 by 3, which is the number of executors on the node. You get 21 gigs. And then you subtract 7% from that because you had to account for overhead. That's 19 gigs. So whew, the answer, as we come up with, is 17 executors in total, 19 gigs of memory per executor, and five cores um, for each executor. By the way, this is not etched in stone, right? These were kind of hand wavy calculations. Your workload may be different, and different companies, for example, may want to oversubscribe. Different organizations may have a workload which doesn't require a lot of sharing, in which case you are OK with having very, very small granular workloads. This is the one we come up with. Yeah, so very commonly, like maybe um, oh, we, that thing's not moving. Yeah, the timer's not moving. So, so we don't actually know how time. we're doing. Um, but um, you might have ones that have lots of I.O. And if you have lots of I.O., your CPU is not the culprit. So you can up your cores. Um, and also, it's a common technique, but it's cheating a little bit, is if you're going to use five cores, maybe you do set the number of cores in Yarn to be 16. And that extra executor in Yarn Manager will fit in that extra core, but nothing else will use it because right. it doesn't divide into it well. Right. Um, so there are kind of little tricks, but those numbers I've found is a good starting place. OK, the clock is moving now. This is great. All right. OK, so one and thing we want to talk about is not just to emphasize the problems, but also what the Spark community is doing to solve those problems. So one of the things the Spark community is doing to fix this magical problem where you have to pay a lot of money to someone like Ted to figure out the answer to this question is to introduce a concept of dynamic allocation. Right? Dynamic allocation is where you can scale up and scale down your cluster depending on your workload. And um, it only works currently with Spark on Yarn. However, it helps you with one of the three things that we, were we discussed as problems early on. So it can help you dynamically figure out the, the number of executors that you need for your job, but it can't help you just yet with the cores that you need for each executor or the memory that you need to give each. And if you guys aren't familiar with it, what it essentially does is allow your application to grow when you're using it and allow it to shrink when you're not. So this solves the typical problem of someone going into Spark Shell and then going out to lunch. Right. And his eating a ham sandwich is consuming half of your cluster. So it solves that problem. Yeah. So it prevents you from having a mortgage from your uh, AWS bill. All right. If you want to read more on this topic, there's a fantastic blog post. And that takes us to mistake number two. OK, so you see this application error. It seems like an integer overflow. You look at the stack trace, and it's not from your application. right? You look at the stack trace and some internal Spark code. And why is this happening? The reason is there's no Spark shuffle block that can be larger than 2 gigs. right? This is crazy. We are in big data world, and we're talking about 2 gigs, and no Spark shuffle block being larger than 2 gigs. Um, but before we talk any further, let's talk about what a shuffle block is. So I think it's best to come back to MapReduce terminology. I, I understand Spark is not the same. Uh, it's easier to explain this concept of shuffle block with MapReduce terminology. So in MapReduce, you have a mapper that composes the output that's going to be sent to one of the reducers. And the reducers then make this reducer local copy 
from a bunch of mappers, each of this reducer local copies is equivalent to a shuffle block. In a diagrammatic way, if you had these two stages and there was a shuffle in between those two stages where, where you have the yellow arrows crossing, um, each of the blue blocks is what's called a partition. Each of the yellow uh, arrow represents a shuffle block. It's the stuff that gets sent from one mapper's output to a reducer that's going to do the computation and do reduce on it. So one more time, you will get an overflow exception if your shuffle block size, which is this yellow arrow, larger than two gigs. And why is that? And this is because Spark uses this object of byte buffer type for expressing blocks. And byte buffer is limited by integers max size, which uh, for signed, it's two gigs at max. Right? So that limitation applies to Spark blocks as well. This is especially problematic for Spark SQL because the default number of partitions is set to 200. This is a particularly low number of partitions, which leads to a higher average block size. So how can you fix that? You fix that by, in general, reducing the number of um, the average partition size, which can be done by increasing the number of, sorry, yeah, reducing the average block size or partition size, and hence increasing the number of partitions. And the second thing you can do is reduce the, um, the skew that you may have in your data. And Ted's going to talk more about that in another, another um, a minute or two. So how do you exactly change that? You, if you're using Spark SQL, you do Spark SQL shuffle partitions property. You manage that. That's, again, set to 200 by default. You probably want to bump that up. In regular Spark applications, you would do something like repartition or coalesce. And then you may ask, well, how many partitions should I have, and how big should the partition be? The rule of thumb is about 128 megs per partition. That will, again, change based on your workload, but that's pretty standard. However, there's one more thing. So the Spark driver usually does bookkeeping around the data that's uh, sent around in shuffles. And it uses different data structures for this bookkeeping if the number of partitions is less than 2,000 or more than 2,000. And guess what? This 2,000 number is actually hard-coded in Spark. right? So if you, if you don't believe me, this is the code from mapstatus.scala. And it says, if uncompressed sizes are larger than 2,000, then you use this highly compressed map status. And if it's less than 2,000, then you use just the regular compressed map status, which, of course, takes a larger memory footprint than the highly compressed map status. So what am I trying to say? If your number of partitions is less than 2,000, but not by a whole lot, it makes sense for you to bump it just a little bit to be over 2,000. OK, let me summarize. So don't have too big partitions because your job is going to fail due to your 2 gig partition limit. Don't have too few partitions because you will slow. You'll be slow and may not make use of the parallelism. Rule of thumb is around 128 megs of parti per partition. If you have number of partitions less than 2,000 but really close, you want to bump that up definitely to be more than 2,000. And you can track this particular Jira for the various improvements that are coming around the 2 gig limit. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Ted, who's going to talk about mistake three. All right, I only got four and a half minutes per mistake, so we got to fly in this sucker. All right, um, now you have a data set that takes 20 seconds to read over, but it takes four hours to do a join. Who's experienced that joy? All right, well, they all tell you here distributed computing is wonderful, and it's because it can take that big long line and it can make it into the short lines. And that's wonderful and fine and dandy, but this is what happens in the majority of your worlds, right? And this is because there's skew. So skew happens because you have a null key, or you have a popular value, or maybe you have stocks as your, your, your data set and apples in your data set, right? And what will happen a lot of times is uh, all, all your work will be going to a single core. And I'll run into a frustrated customer that's like, I doubled my node size. You know, um, I'm you know, spending all this money on AWS, or I'm buying all this hardware from HP, and my job isn't getting faster. And I'm like, well, that's great. You have 100 nodes, and you're using a single core out of the 100 nodes. Why don't we fix that? Um, so first thing to know, if you have SKU, you shouldn't have SKU. There's no mathematical or scientific uh, computer science reason why SKU has to exist in your world. Um, a simple way of so solving it, we'll walk through three of them, but they're basically all the same, and it's this idea of salting. So what is salting, right? If your normal key is foo, let's say, uh, a salted key would be foo and some random stuff, right? So just think of putting a little bit of salt on it, and the salt ran uh, falls randomly. What this will do is this will make the distribution, you know, it'll, it'll spread it out more. You'll have more keys, and especially like if you had a null key, right? You now, you would, you would have even more. So let's just put this in, first, uh, put this in a pretty little graph, because pictures are good. 
Um, in this data set, right, so half of my data is going to go to a single core, and uh, a quarter of it's going to go to another core, and then I'm going to get some distribution uh, on the rest of the data set. But if I put a random value of just 0 or 1 next to each key, uh, it's the top circle. And you can see that top circle looks a lot better than the other circle on the other page. Now if I put 0 to 7 uh, salts after each key, I get that bottom one. And if you can tell from the bottom one, skew is now a recent history, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and there's no reason why you have to stop at 8. Um, there's no example. Oops. Uh, OK. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. So how do you solve this, right? You do the salted reduced by key, right? So let's say you're doing the stock example and you have apple, that, and you did uh, eight salts. Then that means you're going to have eight totals for apple, right? Then you just follow that by another reduce from the eight totals of apple, right? So let's say you've gone from a billion records down to the number of stocks is about 20,000, so 20,000 times eight. Something like that. Something and uh, then you're just reducing that. You're reducing the aggregate. And you'll find that this is a lot better than having one core do all your work. Um, there's other patterns of doing it. You can do isolated. So let's uh, say most of your data set is fine. And it can do a reduce by key. But you have one or two keys that suck, right? You could just salt the ones that suck and then treat everything else the same. Um, and then there's another concept where uh, maybe you're doing a join. And maybe, uh, again, you have. Um, some keys that have really high cardinality and some that don't. And you could put those into memory and do a map join on the ones with high cardinality. And the ones that don't, you can use the regular group by. Uh, I am going fast, and I apologize for that. Uh, the other one that sucks a lot, and it's not necessarily skew, but it's just as evil, is Cartesian join. Has anybody in this room ever had Cartesian joins? Yeah, they suck. Um, you know what? They don't have to suck. So there's this beautiful thing. Oh, you forgot the other one. Oh, it's OK. Um, all right. So uh, I changed the slide earlier, but there's another slide. Has anybody used nested types? Right? All right. So with nested types, uh, we had the wrong slide right up here, but it's all, all right. You, and you can come later if you need more explanation. With nested types, you can do those, uh, those um, Cartesian joins without doing the Cartesian join. Right? You can essentially, if you had 1,000 times 1,000 and you did a Cartesian join, that would come out with a million. What you can essentially do is one key, the first cell would be nested of 1,000, and the next cell would be nested of 1,000. They would all come into memory at the same time. You would do your Cartesian in memory. You wouldn't have to write it out. It wouldn't have to explode to an RDD, and everyone's happy. This is going to be multiple magnitudes faster than doing a Cartesian. Um, and then last is just be very cognizant of your partitions. Again, uh, Mark had mentioned before about Cartesians during your shuffle. But let's just say you have a heavy uh, computational operation you have to do on a very small data set. Uh, it, makes, it might make sense to expand your processing just to do that heavily, uh, the heavy uh, computation and then shrink it back to do the writing. Always be cognizant of that. And when you're using dynamic allocation, you're only using what you're using. So it's going to give back those resources. Right. Um, and I, I'm, 11, I'm 11 seconds ahead. All right, so next problem. Um, let's see. Do you ever run out of memory? Do you ever have um, you know, 20 stages? And is your driver ever doing a lot of work, right? So this is kind of an encompass of just bad behavior. So um, first off, um, at this conference, they're going to tell you that Spark is amazing and that it allows you to do anything. And what will happen is a whole bunch of people who did not go through the MapReduce era. Who went through the MapReduce era? OK, shuffles suck, right? Am I wrong? All right. Now, the people who didn't go through that will look at the Spark code and say, oh, it's so pretty. And look, I can do SQL now. And I don't have to think about anything. I'm just going to write my business rules in here, right? And what's going to happen is they're going to have a whole crap load of shuffles. Well, shuffles still suck, right? And if you really want to do a good job, you're going to remove as many shuffles as you can. Look for when you can reuse the same keys. Look for storage patterns that help you, like um, have things already pre-sorted, uh, nested tables. There's tons of little tricks. But in the end, all the memory and RDD magic in the world is not going to save you from a shuffle. Shuffles suck. And they don't scale linearly. So it's, it's, it's working against you. OK, next one. Uh, group by key. Group by key is like, the, the, you know, it's like free money to me, because I'm a consultant. So I come in, and they're like, oh, it blows up. I ran out of memory. Group by key is a wonderful interface. So if you have that skew, everything goes into the memory of a single executor, and then boom, you die. 
there's no reason why you can't do anything that you can do with group by key with reduce by key. So unless you, you know, unless you really, really, really know your data 100%, you can tell your boss you will never have more than a million records or so for a single key, and you're fine with that, and your paycheck's fine with that, and your bonus is fine with that, and you don't want to get a phone call in the middle of the night, just use reduce by key. Um, all right, then there's tree reduce and reduce, and do we have a pretty graphic for that? I have a pretty graphic for that later on, and I already talked about nested types and complex types. If you guys have not done nested structures or ordered nested structures, just do it. It's so awesome. I've been doing it for the last six months. And uh, so an example, I was at a client where they're like, oh, Spark will solve everything. I just put everything in memory. And the query ran for three days. And then I said, well, can I just use nested types and order it like this? And they said, yeah, 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 but he won't do better. And I got it down to three minutes. So um, it's really important how you order your data. Especially if your data doesn't change that often, like with HDFS. But even if it changes a lot, you can store it in something like Kudu that keeps the sorted order and partition in order for you, even if the data is mutable, uh, highly mutable. Am I running low? I'm running late. Oh, man. OK, uh, so I talked about a lot of this stuff. Uh, DAG management. You don't want to do shuffles. Reduce your shuffles as much as you can. Uh, I talked about all these. Yes. OK, so this is the one I didn't talk about because we had a graphic. So there's reduce and there's reduce, uh, tree reduce. So reduce is great. It will, it's not reduced by key. This is reduced. This brings everything back to the driver. Uh, what you want to do is a tree reduce, because then it does a reduce on every partition and then just sends you the results back to the driver. You don't want to send everything back to the driver. You only have one driver. Be gentle with it. If you're not, it will run away in a deep exception, and it won't come back. Um, oh, complex types. We already talked about this. Um, yeah, uh, nested types, aggregated types. Uh, top end lists, stuff like that. Be creative. Uh, you can put anything in your RDDs. Oh, OK, so this is one example. And I won't go into it, but you can go Google this blog. So I was at a customer that was using an ETL tool that I'm not going to tell you about because it would be embarrassing to that ETL tool. And they wrote a SQL statement that would do table stats on a table. And it produced uh, 1,500 MapReduce jobs to do table stats on a single table. It had a lot of columns. And to their defense, it had 300 columns. But anyways, this is an example of how to do that in, in one shuffle, right? So again, it doesn't have to suck if you just think about what you're doing. OK, problem number five. All right, almost there. OK, now this one doesn't happen as much anymore, but it used to happen a lot, and it still can happen a little bit. It happened to me a couple months ago. Has anybody ever had method not found exception? All right, good, good, good. Th those are your advanced users. And so they were bringing in a library that was unfriendly to Spark. All right, now Spark, have they fixed the Guava thing yet? Guava is fixed, yeah. Guava is fixed. So Guava now works. So this, this isn't a Guava exception, but that one's fixed. But what happens if you're using protobufs, like I was using, and Spark was using protobuf 2.5, and I wanted protobuf 3? Well, um, at first it doesn't work, right? But there's a nifty little trick. Um, there's this thing with shade. If you can look down on the second thing, see the shade pattern thing? So I can bring in my own dependency, and I can say I want it to be under this own uh, package, which essentially means when it compiles my code, it looks like a totally different set of classes than the classes in Spark. I hope that made sense. If it doesn't, come get, come get me later on. So, this, so don't ever accept. Uh, class, uh, class pass says your class loading issues to be a deterrent with Spark. And Spark Tech 2 has fixed yeah. the guava. I think what we're trying to say is that if you're using any generic library, the version of library you're using in your application has to match up exactly with the version of library that Spark is using. And this is very common for libraries like guava and protobuf. However, the fix to that, if you want to use different versions, is to shade your library and relocate the package names to something else. Um, however, if you're using Guava, starting Spark 2.0, as the slide says, it's fully shaded, so you don't have to worry about for Guava, but other libraries are still problems. There's going to be some people in the audience that are like, Shade, what the heck is Shade? Shade's like a, so I use Maven, so I'm not an SBT guy, sorry about that. But in Maven, there's this thing called Shade, which makes like an Uber jar for you, so you don't have to think. And I like not thinking. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Oh, you're doing a summary. All right, so we're going to do summary gangsta style. And you get 60 Got seconds it. of questions. Yeah. Got to size up your executors, right? So make sure that you're specifying the priorities that you need to specify. You got a two gig limit on your Spark shuffle blocks. Skew and Cartesians are evil. You got to award them. 
Learn to manage your DAG, yo, and do shady stuff. Don't let class fat leaks mess you up. Before we go, I want to say, writing applications in Spark is like finding your soulmate on Tinder. <laughs> you know the chances are really low, but you do it anyway. <laughs> Every once in a while, you get it right. I but you I still I wonder how long it's going to last. I found mine in art class. That's all from us. Thank you very much. This is Ted Velasca. I'm Mark Grover. These are the slides. We'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. And this guy is great. Give him another hand. Whatever. OK, we've got, we've got about three minutes. Make sure you keep your questions short and brevity. Don't do a Cartesian join when you're asking a question. Yeah. And we'll so be by please the, we'll be by the line up over here. And they're going to be at the Cloud Era booth if you want to talk to them. So here we go. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be by the booth. I don't fly home until tomorrow. Uh, hi, so I have a fast question. I actually am interested in Spark because I automatically generate the program logic. And I could still see a lot of these techniques being used even in an automatically generated context, yes. which means that it could be, that same sophistication could be in the framework. Any projects? Say again. So the, I think the question was incorrect, correct us if we didn't get it wrong. So even with all the auto generation that's happening, you were, you were saying that some of the sophistication can be built into the product. How is that coming along? Is that your question? OK. So I guess we are trudging through it. I would kind of, mm. I would say that some of the sophistication can be built in. Some can't be built in the auto-generated part. For example, if you notice the dynamic allocation part, that's skew. outside of the, any of the realm of auto-generation. Yeah. That's up to you how you want to size your clusters and how you want to send your queries. So that's outside. Yeah, some of the DAG management will get better as the query optimizer gets better. But there's a joke among consultants that you can't fix stupid. And um, there are certain things like skew that is very hard to do without, with zero cost. Right? Because to even know, if, if you don't know the data, the program would have to do some kind of, like if you do table sets, right? So like, uh, yes, if you did some type of table sets, then maybe you could avoid something like that. But it's a hard problem to solve, and it's solved with just you know, thinking a little bit. And there's a lot of other shinier features that people normally focus on before they'll focus on that. But it, it right. could all be done. Plus, that's job security for us. Yeah, I got a job forever. Uh, Hi. Uh, great talk. Thanks. So do you think group by key is overly demonized? Do you really think there is no use case where group by key actually will be better than reduced well, by key? Well, I mean, you can do anything that in group by key that with reduced by key. That's, that's like. That's true. But that's true. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why I demonize it is because I don't want a phone call at nighttime. Because I, unless I have super strong guarantees on the data that's coming in, um, it could cause trouble, right? OK, so just at the risk of extending the question, uh, I've really seen use cases where people end up using combined by key and aggregate by key, and that like, sort of hogs up more memory than it, than it would have been with group by key. So for example, if you have a uh, RDD of string comma string, and you just want to collect all the uh, values for a key, then group by key actually might be better. It might think? be in yeah. that situation, in some situations. but. Because you don't have to you know, use hash maps on each of the executors to actually keep a track of yeah, uh, data about keys. So yeah, that's more I, work I, with yeah, possible. Yeah, it, it's one of these like, yeah. if, I could kill a, if I could kill a fly with a shotgun and all I had was a shotgun, I would kill it with a shotgun. Um, yeah. That's a very American thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, if, if, either let the fly bother me or take it out. So I mean, yeah, I'm just, it, it's always all to right. be, we're full of. I got think. one more question. In the I think we got one more question. That's it. Yeah. Keep it short, please. Hi. Um, how do you set your Python worker memory in your Spark config? Oh. So when, when the you presenters would... stare at each other with blank looks, that means they don't know the answer yeah. to that. We are both Scala people. We Scala, actually don't, sorry. <laughs> don't really use Python. Sorry. So, um, yeah, uh, but to Python's defense, I don't think there's significant performance degradation, but I don't know yeah. the answer to your. Sorry OK, guys, give another hand to this Thank you. tandem talk. Thank you.